listening to the GM Shuffle with Michael Lombardi, presented by DraftKings and VSIN. Here is Femi Abebefe. Welcome to another edition of the GM Shuffle with Michael Lombardi, presented by DraftKings and VSIN. I'm your host, Femi Abebefe. As always, make sure to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts. Our producer, Elliot Bowman, with us on the ones and twos. Michael, in other sports, it's opening day. I know it's rainy out there in the Northeast where you're hanging out. I mean, the Phillies game got postponed. We got the Mets game that got postponed. But baseball fans out there, I'm sure, excited for the season to come. But how you doing? I know the weather's been a little bit uh, touch and go over there in Ocean City. Yeah, no, it's not touch and go. It's windy as hell. It reminds me of when I had that bicycle when I was a kid and I threw it away the minute I got a driver's license. Like, it's too goddamn windy. You can't move. It's ridiculous. And now we're, you know, we're thinking about building an arc here. I mean, we got like oh, rain really? coming down. So I don't know. They canceled the Phillies game, I mean, before the, before the day even started. Like, they're like, out, we're out. We can't play this. They knew it was going to be a slosh out. So. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, you know, East March is the worst month uh, because you just you get teased by a nice day mm-hmm. and then you get this horrendous weather, you know. And so but life goes on. We still have football. We got the final. We got the Sweet 16. Yeah. We got a lot of things to do. So ain't nothing wrong with staying in, just watching a little tube, hanging out and, you know, talking about all these things we're going to talk about. Yeah, yeah, I noticed you skipped over the potential NBA playoffs in the play-in next month. Your Sixers and Bede might be back for that one. That'll why be, uh, would that'll I? Be... Why would I, I? I didn't even watch the Clippers game. I, I watched was some tough... murder drama on yeah. on Hulu last night. Like I'm not even going there. Like, and now they say he's going to come back. Like, what kind of condition is he going to be in when he comes back? Like, seriously. I don't know. Yeah. You know, to me, I've given up on that. That that that, that is uh, that's a long. That, that, there's no truth. They're gonna they they might have to play Boston to get in just to get in. That's three. What is it? Just you know, all they do is win one game or two games. They have, there's no chance. Yeah, and it depends if they're the seven or the eight. But we don't have to get into all that stuff. We're a football podcast. We're not an NBA podcast. But who knows? Maybe Embiid will surprise us all and be in shape. Uh, no, surprise being the oper- surprise being the operative word right there. Let's get to the football though, because we saw the LSU pro day yesterday. Meaning Jaden Daniels, yeah. uh, a guy who's now th- thought of as the consensus number two pick in this draft. But that is not as strong a statement as we could have made maybe a month ago with some of the shakeup in the betting market. We'll get into that in a little bit here. But Jaden Daniels finally weighed in. He came in at 210 pounds, which was, he was listed at on the LSU roster. So he's 210. He threw for NFL teams. Didn't do any of the movement stuff, which makes me believe that maybe we were packing on uh, the pasta maybe leading up to this pro day to make sure we weighed in all right. But, you know, Jaden Daniels is able to go out there and meet some teams, and we know he's going to meet with the Commanders, the Patriots, all these teams that are looking at quarterbacks in this upcoming draft. They can go ahead and get to know Jaden Daniels a little bit better. Well, you know what's interesting about this draft that nobody really kind of talks about is 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 the quarterbacks in this draft uh, have been transfer portal players, right? So mm-hmm. Michael Penix at, at Indiana plays really well for Caden DeBoard, and then trans and then then DeBoard leaves to go to Fresno. He doesn't play well, and he goes to Washington, reunites with DeBoard, and reevaluates his career. Daniels at Arizona State in 2021, you know, throws 10 touchdown passes, 10 interceptions, starts 13 games, you know, just doesn't look very good in that that year. And you're like, wait a minute, where, where was the kid we saw in 19, right, who mm-hmm. threw 17 touchdown passes and two interceptions? And then he goes to LSU and he throws 57 touchdown passes with seven interceptions. So in, in his 16 games career there. So for me, you know, this is kind of, and then Bo Nix, we still have Bo mm-hmm. Nix to talk about, right? He transfers, not good at Auburn, transfers to Oregon, looks sensational. And of course, Caleb Williams was good at Oklahoma and he transferred. So, you know, we're talking about four of the six quarterbacks that that did, that transferred. And what, what the telling tale in this whole conversation is, is they were, good, other than Williams, they mm-hmm. were good. Then when the coach left, they weren't good. When the coach came back, when they got reunited with the right coach, they looked good again. And so there's a little bit to learn in all that, which is even though if we draft a guy, who's going to develop the guy? Who's going to make this player better? And I think Daniels is clearly, in my mind, the number two quarterback in the draft. I think there, there's no question about that. Mm-hmm. His ability, I, I'm not as worried about his, his weight. I know he's linear. But, you know, he's going to have to learn how to get down. He's going to have to learn how to take care of his body. But, you know, he's got height to him. He isn't a short player, and he doesn't play short. There's some times where Caleb Williams will play small because he's 6'1", and he does play small. 
Now, I'm not suggesting Caleb Williams isn't the best player. I'm just saying there are times. But Daniels, to me, is the is the second best player. He can he can move. He makes plays with his feet. I think he's got to be grooved into the right system. I don't think he's a West Coast passer. I think he's a I don't think he's a progression read passer. I think he's a high low passer, which is what I wrote about in the column for Vison, which you have to separate the two and understand the difference between what teams are asking the player to do and what the offense wants them to do. Whereas if you're going to Sean Payton, you're going to be, you're, you're reading it, you're throwing the ball where he wants you to throw it. If you're playing for, you know, a high-low offense, you're reading off of two guys and then making a decision. So, you know, for me, I think he's clearly the one, the second best player. I don't see how it's close. We can talk about McCarthy in a minute, but I think he proved it in that workout. Yeah, no, it's it a really good. I mean, he was the Heisman Trophy winner. He went ahead and went uh, and was running roughshod over SEC defense. Seeing him do it at the highest of levels in that SEC conference, there he was the best player by far in the conference and had that LSU team competitive, a team that was had some holes at least defensively, able to put up a lot of points here. Because I do want to get into these quarterbacks here, just because I have the manual in front of me right now, the the 2013 manual that you sent me last year for the grading system here. And you have it specifically because I think a lot of times as fans, we think about grades as, is this a first round player, a second round player? No, this is, it's numerical. You have to grade them based on what they're going to enter into, not just based on their contemporaries in that draft class. When you see these quarterbacks and the starting quarterback threshold for you right now is uh, it's 6-0, at least as development players, 6-4 to 6-2 are circumstantial starters, good to quality backups. Starting QBs are 6-6 to 6-5. How many of those quarterbacks that you've watched here in this draft fit that 6665 range and above when you've seen them play on tape? Well, I, I think, see, this is why you have to have a grading system. Because w- when we talk, when everybody talks about players in the draft, they only talk about the current draft, right? Mm-hmm. And so they don't compare the player to somebody else. They compare them to the other players in the draft. And therefore, then all of a sudden, well, you got to take McCarthy at two or you got to take this guy here. But when you compare them to other players and you put a grade on them and you and you define what you think this player will become in pro football, right? And the verbiage is more important than anything. You have to have the right verbiage. If you don't have the right verbiage that attached to the player's name, you really can't accurately grade the player. You know, like if you were to grade, let's go back to Kenny Pickett. Okay, when Kenny Pickett got picked, what was he, the 20th pick overall in the draft? Mm -hmm. When Pittsburgh turned that card in, it was pretty clear. They took took a player without elite skills. They took a player that was always going to be on the best version of himself, a lower-end starter. He was going to probably have to be in that category. He was not going to be above, you know, anything more than a 65, right? You know, that was probably the high end for this guy. There's no way you could have put him in the 67. He didn't really have any elite traits to him. You know, it's the mis- to me when you when I graded Mac Jones, the mistake I made on Mac Jones was I thought his elite traits were going to be mental and decision making. That proved to be false. OK, so you, you're wrong there. Same thing with Pickett, not an elite arm. You were hoping that maybe he's going to be elite in decision making and, and processing. Again, not right. So when I look at these guys, uh, you know, I'm looking for elite skill sets, right? I'm looking for something that is going to put the player in the top 10 at his position. Okay, what is going to do that? And how is that going to happen? And I think you can clearly say that, you know, to me, Caleb Williams is a high-end three-down starter. No question. Okay, you can Mm -hmm. clearly say that he has that ability, right? And and then you've got to be able to – then after that, I think Daniels has a chance to be a solid starting quarterback. I think I would grade Daniels a 67. I probably would grade Caleb a 7-0. He would be at the low end of a high-end starter. He wouldn't be generational to me. He would be at the low end because there's too many things, 30 fumbles. There's too many things he does that, that keeps him out of being like a generational player. And then from there, I, I, I think from there – May is the hardest guy to grade because he's got great size. He's young. He played better when you watch the 22 tape than when you watch the 23 tape. He's the guy who takes more time to evaluate. And I'm not sure I'm, I'm, I'm where I need to be on him. And then you've got Knicks and you got McCarthy, who to me, if you like them, and there's a lot to like about both players, you're trying to get them to 67. But for the most part, you probably are going to put him in the 66 category or 65. 
you're not getting elite unless you believe McCarthy's elite traits are his athleticism, his ability to process because he's very good on third down, and and you and he can be handle the whole thing because over his career he's been very effective. Same thing with Knicks. You know, when I watch Knicks, I see a guy that fits what Sean Payton wants to do more than I see it with McCarthy. Like I see, I see Knicks being more of that player. Good foot quickness, the ability to process, gets the ball out. Not always accurate. I mean, he's not Drew Brees, but his numbers are incredible in terms of the size. He's bigger. You know, he's he's got a lot of things you like, but is he going to be a top 10 player? I think a lot of that's going to come down to where he goes. I mean, you know, and it's hard to because the guy's thrown almost 70, over 70 percent both years. I mean, how many touchdown passes does this guy have in his career? I mean, he's only thrown 10 interceptions his whole time in Oregon. Think about that. Yeah. Yeah, no, they were, they were a machine offensively this past season. I mean, the guy started, like, what, 60-something college football games? That's a ridiculous amount of starts and experience there. So Drake May and Michael Penix will be having their pro days today at North Carolina and Washington. Where does Michael Penix fit into all of this here? Is he a little bit lower than the six 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 five range there, or does he also kind of fit near that Knicks McCarthy range? Well, I, I think he kind of fits in that Knicks McCarthy range. I think you've got to be very specific with him. You know, I think he ha- you have to be – it's got to be a play-action pass, vertical pass game down the field, high-low reads, right? I mean, look, when he was at Indiana in 20, when he was playing really well, and as a freshman when he was there and he was playing – I mean, he carried that program. He was very effective. Over the, over the two seasons, he threw 24 touchdown passes, eight interceptions. And then the bad year in 21 where he wasn't good and he got hurt. And then he transfers, and all of a sudden, now he's up to 77 touchdown pass. I mean, it's yeah. insane how many touchdown passes these guys throw. But the the good thing about it is what you said, Femi, all these guys have so many games they've played. Mm-hmm. So I, I think a lot of with Penix is going to come down to the right system. Yeah, that, it's going to be interesting with Penix. I know the injury stuff has scared some people with him when they've evaluated, some people in the media with the knee injuries that he suffered also was banged up this past season. Uh, on the other side, I want to break down what these numbers mean for our newer audience and newer listeners, and also what is it about Drake May that makes him a difficult evaluation? We'll discuss that next. You're listening to the GM Shuffle with Michael Lombardi, presented by DraftKings and VSIN. Here is Femi Abebefe. I think it's really important to set the criteria, like you've talked about here with the grading system here, not just putting first round grade, second round grade, third, no actual grading systems in comparison to the players that they'll be facing in the NFL and the other quarterbacks that are in the NFL. And you mentioned Caleb Williams, your top guy in this quarterback class, the presumptive number one overall pick to the Chicago Bears. A 7-0 player, so the 9-0 to 7-0 is a starting quarterback, first-year starting QB with a minimum of good level ability in all critical factors and positional skills, or he has very good or better ability in the majority of critical factors and positional skills that will allow him to overcome one to two positional skills that are at the sufficient level. Circumstances may be the reason this player starts in the first season. However, this player will develop quickly into a very good starting quarterback and the reason you win games. That's a really critical one. As a Pro, this player is a Pro Bowl caliber player, consistent premier player, and a difference maker at the position based on what he does. He in capital words right there, or capital letters, I should say. So Caleb Williams is the only guy that you've seen in this draft class that fits that mold so far as, hey, this could be a win because of, not necessarily a win with kind of guy. Yeah, I, well, I think, uh, yeah, because I think he is, he can make plays off schedule. He's got a great in anticipation with the ball. Now, sometimes he makes mistakes off schedule, but I think he does have that skill set to really challenge the defense. You know, I wish he were bigger. I wish he were taller because there's sometimes when he works the pocket, he doesn't play as big as he needs to, but he can spin it really well. There's no throw he can't make. He doesn't need a lot of room to make throws, which is really important. And so I think he gives you that player that you can build a team around. And you know, you've got to be very excited about his skill set. And then you really got to drill down on it. what kind of leader is he? You know, what can he handle? What can you put on his plate? What What is he comfortable with, right? I think that's the second step you got to take. And, and I think ultimately that's where you feel like, okay, this is how we're going to build the offense around him. 
And then Jaden Daniels, who said fits into the 6'9 to 6'7 category. I'll read this one really quickly here just so folks have an idea what we mean when we say this is a 6'7 player. Second year, good starting quarterback with a majority of good or better level critical factors, meaning leadership, decision making, overall accuracy, clutch production, and has a minimum of sufficient level ability in all remaining critical factors and positional skills. This player is one of the reasons you win games. Circumstances may cause this player to start in his first season, but he ideally needs a year to adjust and develop into a good starter level quarterback this type of player may ascend into very good starting QB but it will take more than two years also this is the one position that try hard slash smart players can elevate themselves into the blue category as a pro this player is a consistent impact player on the game for his club he may not dominate but he consistently contributes towards the success of his club so that's kind of like the the second tier of quarterbacks not like not above average only, but guys who like the, I, I hear that. And I think of the Dak Prescott, the Kirk cousins. That's what I think about when I, yeah. I read that category right there. I, I, you know, I, when you were reading it, I'm thinking this is, this is Dak Prescott, yeah. you know, and it's not his fault. They paid him like a blue player. He's, a, you know, he's really, a, you know, a red level or, you know, and so that's to me what, what this is. And there's some things, you know, you got to get, a, you got to get past on, on Caleb, on, on Jaden Daniels. You got to feel comfortable with his mental you got to feel comfortable with his maturity. You got to feel comfortable with his work habits. You got to feel comfortable with what you put on his plate. You know, he's very coachable. You know, he's played in a lot of games. And obviously, the beautiful thing about him when you watch him is he has gotten better, you know, but there are times where he's erratic with his accuracy. I think he's going to need to be in a very, this is not a, a, a negative. This is just something that I think he's going to have to be in a simple offense that relies on high, low reach, check down or go. And I think he'll be able to make that happen. And he's got the traits to improve his game and his athleticism. So for me, I think there that is where you got to really, but again, it comes down to, you know, you got to, if you're, if you're picking Daniels, if you're picking Knicks, you got to figure out what went wrong at Auburn when he was there, what went wrong at Indiana and what goes right at Washington and what went right at Oregon, right? I think you got to really, really study that closely. It's the same thing you have to do with Penix. You got to study what went wrong in Indiana and what went right at Washington. So if I'm a Washington Commanders fan listening to this and I'm holding the second overall pick, with what you said with Daniels needs to be in that high, low, kind of go sort of offense that's a little bit more simplified, does that fit what what Cliff Kingsbury wants to do down there in Washington? Is that a good marriage if they were to pair those two together? Well, it is because that that's that is not a complex system, right? It's a high low read system, and you know that's where you it's going to be a lot of RPO stuff. It's going to be you know read it, throw it, you know, kind of get the ball down the field, make plays. Uh, you know, Cliff's added more tight end to the system, but yeah, I think it does. I think I think that fits him with that big playability with his arm because he can certainly make a lot of good plays, right? He can really develop and make it down the field that it gives you a chance. And I think if they're comfortable with his with his capacity to learn and grow, I think it becomes easy for them. You know, one of the things which you read that is what I think tilts the field a little bit towards some of these guys is people fall in love with their work habits. Right. And so that takes it over the top. And I think sometimes it's one of the reasons why, you know, you believe that Mac Jones is going to be a good player, or you believe that, you know, that, uh, that Tim Tebow was going to be a good player because you felt like, Oh God, well, you know, I mean, look, you know, he's going to work really hard. He's a great leader, yada, 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 all that stuff. Well, and the reality of it is, is you, you didn't get any of that, right? You, you did not get any of that. So I think you got to be really careful. And, and that's kind of what I wrote about. I mean, I wrote, I wrote about this in, in the column and, you know, what I said in my column was, you know, that there, JP Morgan has a great quote. He says, every man has two reasons for doing something, a good one and a real one. And I think (laughs) NFL teams have a really good reason for taking a quarterback, but what's the real one, right? There's a good reason to take one. What's the real one? And I think it's a little bit like the gold rush in 1849, where you think you're going to find gold. And you think you're going to take this kid who works really hard, who's got great character, and turn him into a star. And teams get blinded by that. They don't really understand player development on the quarterback. And they feel like, oh, if we just had a better receiver, a better coach, we'll finally have all the gold we ever wanted. 
and they forget that the gold rush, the people that made the most money in the gold rush were the ones selling picks and shovels. <laughs> that's, that's hilarious. That's the people that were just selling the stuff to try to find people the gold that was actually making all the money. Drake May, you said, is a difficult evaluation. What makes him difficult to evaluate when you watch him on tape? I know you said that you're still working on him as well, but just from what you've seen so far. And also, where does he kind of fall on the spectrum here of the grading system? Well, I mean, look, he's six four and a half. He's the two. I think he, you know, I don't know what his. I think he's, you know, he's two thirty. Can get mm-hmm. bigger. He's really young. I mean, he's really young, and and he's got huge upside if you can get some things worked out, right? You know, his he's a little bit too elongated with his delivery. He he's got to get tightened up. He doesn't process as quickly as you like. And there's times where there's throws that you say, God, can't you make a better throw here? His 22 tape was better. He had better vision in 22. I thought he saw the field better. Uh, but for the most part, you know, he he can process. And I think the, the, the challenge in grading Drake May isn't grading what you see. It's grading what you think he can become. And you've got to have a conviction with that. And everybody's going to tell you from Henderson, North Carolina, to where he is in, in Chapel Hill that he's a great kid with great mm-hmm. football intelligence. And that goes a long way, right? And so can you process, can you make this player a better player? I think there's upside here. I think the arrow's up. And in the grading system, he's kind of a player where you want to say he's a developmental player, but you can't grade him there because it's too low. Yeah. So you're going to have to nail it down. And so like the, the system kind of forces you to declare. And you don't, you're not sure you have enough evidence to declare. you got to make a decision, right? You can't just dump them in the, well, this guy needs development. And all of a sudden, you have a bunch of 6-0 players, right? Because yeah. if you put them there, you're not going to be able to draft them. I think that's going to be it. And I think today is going to tell a lot about his mechanics, what you feel like. Uh, there's a complete different spectrum. I know some people that really love May. I know some people that don't like May at all. But I think there's some character issue that you really believe he can overcome. And the Josh Allen, in my mind, is what's really challenging me because I didn't think Allen could improve his accuracy, you know, but he did. And Allen's size is, you know, it, it, it's, it's kind of, he just takes over, right? He's 6'5", six, he's, six he's so goddamn big, and you're saying to yourself, wait a minute, hold on here. You know, uh, I mean, like, you know, he got better, he got bigger, he worked hard. Maybe May could be that same size. You know, maybe he could end up being that same kind of body. Yeah, because I mean, May is also a pretty good athlete as well. He's mobile. Like, he's he's not going to be a statue back there. I mean, I don't know if he's as good of an athlete. I don't think he's going to be hurtling people like Josh Allen does sometimes, which is good. The Bills sometimes hold their breath on those plays. But he's still a pretty good athlete. Might be able to use him a little bit in the run game. Is May, Is it fair to say that May is, outside of Caleb Williams, is May the guy that you would – I guess, bet on that could potentially get to that 7-0 plus category saying that, okay, he could potentially be the guy that we win because of, and these other guys, maybe 6-9 is potentially the ceiling for them. Yeah, I, I think that's, if, if you believe that, right? And, you know, looking at 22, he's the, he's the player of the year in the conference. Yeah. Right? 22 is just a true freshman. He's the player of the year, not a true freshman. It was a redshirt freshman. Or whatever he was, yeah, he was played like, four games as a, you know, I think he played four games in 21. So he was a redshirt friend. He's a player of the year. And then in 23, he wasn't the same guy, you know, that his, his accuracy wasn't the same, the processing wasn't, you know, he didn't throw as many touch. I mean, through 38 touchdown passes in 22, I think if you're taking him, you're saying the 22 tape is what you're getting. And if you put him at 69, mm-hmm. that's what you're saying. And, and, and I don't know if it's not, I, I think to me, but one of the things you have to do, Femi, is you got to ask yourself if this doesn't, if he doesn't become a good player, why? I mean, if he doesn't become a starting quarterback that can lead us to a championship, why? And then you got to really study the whys. Mm. Uh, he's a fascinating guy because I think back to when this whole draft process started. The draft process pretty much starts at the beginning of college football season. It was always Williams May 1-2, but now we've played the season, and now we've kind of gone through this process through the pro days now. May will have his a little bit later today, and now it's Williams is number one, but Daniels is two, or maybe some people like McCarthy at two. Uh, it, it feels like yeah, May— Yeah, McCar- McCarthy's the riser, right? Yeah. And so, but Walsh used to say this all the time. When guys have a lot of tape, you know, you're going to find bad tape. Yeah. 
That's fair. That's fair. I mean, that's kind of the Justin Herbert thing and the Josh Allen thing that we talked about, where it's like, hey, you, you saw Herbert at Oregon. It's like, ah, is he really the guy? Then you get to the NFL. It's like, oh, yeah, I think we're all just kind of overthinking this thing. Maybe we're overthinking Yeah, but he had the it. senior bowl that helped him. If May had the senior bowl, that could have helped him. 100%. That does it for us here on the DK Network for the podcast. We'll keep it rolling with some of the other news and notes. What do we think of the new kickoff rule, the trade deadline being pushed back, and also Dynasty? You're listening to the GM Shuffle with Michael Lombardi, presented by DraftKings and v Here is Femi Abebefe. There'll be a new era of football played in the NFL with this new hybrid kickoff rule that the league has now adopted here. And it's really interesting. It's got one-year trial, so we'll do it through to the 2024 season. We'll see if we all like it, and then maybe it goes on beyond. Or if we hate it, we'll scrap it and go back to the old rule. But the new rule suggests that kick- the kicking team will line up on the opponent's 40-yard line. So the kicker will still be on their own 35. The kick team will be on the opponent's 40. The receiving team will line up on their own 35-yard line. So they'll only be five yards apart. The goal with that being that, hey, it's not as big of a collision won't be as dangerous as a full sprint running into each other gladiator style. But the players, this is the important one, the players cannot move until the ball passes the 20-yard line except for the kicker. And if the ball is kicked into the end zone, the touchback goes all the way out to the 30-yard line as opposed to the 25. But if the ball lands in the target zone, which is the 20-yard line to the end zone, if it rolls into the end zone from that target zone, the receiving team will get the ball on their own 20. So essentially it's incentivizing more kick returns because we were – at an all-time low in terms of returns for kickoffs. And this is what the NFL wanted, which is kind of taken out the surprise onside kick. You now must declare if you're going to kick an onside kick, which you can now do the unbalanced formations again. But, Michael, your thoughts on the new hybrid kickoff rules and uh, what you think special teams coaches think of it? Well, I mean, the reason we, we don't get as many returns is we got these kickers that can kick the ball the, from here to eternity, right? I mean, their yeah. kicking power is incredible. So – that eliminates returns on itself. I, I, I don't like it because it takes away the opportunity to put strategy into the game. I think when you now no longer can use the onside kick, I mean, I'm sure Bill Polian and Tony Dungy would be screaming, why didn't we have this when we played the Saints in the Super Bowl, right? Because they wouldn't get that extra possession, <laughs> yeah. you know? You can't you you can't fool anybody with this. And the surprise onside kick is we don't see it all the time. It's mm-hmm. very low percentage, but it's one of the plays that you really enjoy seeing. It's it's a strategy that I hate taking out of the game. And I think this is a little bit to me. I didn't think it would pass. I thought it was a little too gimmicky. Mm-hmm. And yet the commissioner got it passed all under the disguise of player safety. Like I said on the McAfee show yesterday, I mean, I'm sure Scott Novak's in his backyard practicing. I mean, he's throwing that flag like crazy. He can't wait. You know, he's waiting to throw it on the hip on the hip tackle. He's probably waiting oh, to throw it on something. Now there's more things to call, you know? So, like, seriously, uh, I don't, I, I'm not a fan. I'm really not, Femi. I think, I mean, it's going to give us more kick returns, and I guess that gives us a more play, because I, I will admit the kickoff, at least recently, with the, the kickers being so good at kicking the ball out of the end zone, also, too, the fact that you get the touchback out to the 25 with the old rule, it just incentivized more touchbacks. I, I did think that it got a little stale and almost a little of like a formality, the actual kickoff. Sometimes teams would take it out of the end zone and then get tackled at the 17-yard line, and as a fan, you're screaming, just kneel the ball and you'll get it at the 25. What are you doing? So this at least adds another play into play into the game like instead of just it being a touchback yeah. so i think that part's interesting but i do i'm gonna miss the surprise on side because we don't get it often but i know andy reed was always especially when he was in philadelphia andy reed loved the surprise on side he loved to do it against the cowboys by the way one time it worked one time it backfired against him but like the surprise on side especially at the start of game i think is really exciting but now it's you have to declare if you're going to kick an onside kick instead of doing the surprise given the setup of the formation so it's a little bit different but i'm, I'm willing to be open-minded and see how it goes in this trial year well for for a team building standpoint you know your kickoff coverage gives you the toughness of your team it's one of the areas you've gained toughness you know now i'm sure nobody in that analytical community would agree with that but or or that toughness is important just like there's no momentum in foot in football but to me the the reality here is you know you do gain toughness from having a really a good kickoff coverage team and and the other thing i'm not sure of femi is 
these guys are so big and so fast that is there really going to be we get collisions when guys go over the middle and get tackled and that's in a short space without a lot of running to the ball to the player these tackles are still going to be violent i mean these players can can tackle and, and bring explosiveness to the tackle in a short area so you know i, I think it's it's going to be interesting to see how the coaches adapt and how they handle it and what they do with the return game yeah, the, the, the return game. Are we going to see like kind of like running plays essentially in the return game? Are they going to be special blocking formations? I think it's going to be really interesting. And a player like maybe Cordero Patterson uh, becomes more valuable because what he's able to do for laterals game yeah. or reverses, yeah, or reverses, or try to just create movement, try to create distortion within the within the thing. Yeah, I think that's going to add something to it. We'll see. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm optimistic. We'll, we'll give it a run. It's a trial and run. We'll see if it works in 2024. If it doesn't, we'll scrap it and go back to the old rules. Uh, real quick, from a personnel and like player acquisition standpoint, the trade deadline got pushed back a week. No longer week yeah. eight. Now it's week nine. So it'll be that first week of November. I think some people even wanted to get pushed back even further. I think week nine yeah. is a perfect spot for it. I don't really want it to go further back uh, because I think sometimes you get some teams that start offloading. And I think for the fan experience, if a team is like a quote unquote seller at the deadline, I don't ever think that's healthy. From a league standpoint, but I think week nine is a perfect kind of middle of the season. You can trade up into that point. Then after that, let's go on and play the second half of the season. Yeah, I, I, you know, it's interesting. John Maris said down at the owners' meetings that they asked him why didn't he trade Saquon at the trade deadline, and he said, "Well, I thought we were still in it." Yeah, you know, and uh, you know, now would he? Have, I guess the question is, would he trade him in week nine if he wasn't in it? You know, again, being in it and understanding it is all subjective to an evaluation. But I do think this will open up a, maybe a little bit more of a window to trade a guy at that time because you know you're not in it. Yeah. And what's, I think from a fan perspective, I, I always, because like baseball and basketball, their trade deadlines are, I think, like two thirds into the season. Like, let's say if the NFL said, all right, deadline week 12. At that point, you can kind of declare if you're in it or you're not in it. And I just, the, ask, the, the, the thought of people selling players off, it's as fans, you lose on that. Like, yeah, like the contending teams, they gain guys. But I think from the overall, like, I don't think you want teams declaring, hey, we don't really care. Let's go ahead and sell pieces off. You're like, we're selling off assets. Like, we need money. Yeah, but it's not like baseball. It takes a guy a little bit of time to get indoctrinated into the system to understand what you're asking him to do. He may make a play here or a play there, but in terms of the overall, it usually will take five to six weeks to get him indoctrinated in. You know, so I think it's a, it, it's a little bit, you need more time with them than just three weeks, four weeks. Yeah. So week nine is interesting. Uh, that will be the new trade deadline coming up here this 2024 season. The Dynasty documentary, the New England Patriots. That's, yeah. It's been one that has been bandied about quite a bit on social media. I've made it through six episodes. I have not watched the four remaining ones. I will do that at some point in the future. But it's been under some criticism. I know you've talked about it. People have been texting you about the documentary saying that it has been sort of a hatchet job to Bill Belichick's legacy in Foxborough. Now we've heard players come out and say that they uh, were, I guess, blindsided by what they've seen so far in the documentary. Matthew Slater, Julian Edelman on Edelman's podcast had this to say about what they saw so far here through Dynasty. Have you been watching the Dynasty? I have been. <laughs> I haven't watched. This is interesting, this dynasty. Uh, some comments that I made on there that made it seem like Bill was just this like very demanding presence. And he was, but I also want people to see there like, are multiple sides of Bill. He's being portrayed in a, a certain light. And if you're in your 30s and you've played football, I don't think you ever liked your football coach. You loved him. Just like I didn't like my parents when they made me do things that they knew was going to make me a better person. We didn't like doing it, but we needed it. Right. Let's make sure none of us forget the fact that the dynasty is not even being talked about without Bill Belichick. That sound courtesy of the <laughs> Julian Edelman Games with Names podcast. I think the Edelman line is perfect. That's what I said. I think it was last week. Sometimes you're MFing your coach, but when you look back, it's like, hey, we really needed that. And it helped, obviously, uh, spark a dynasty over 20 years. Well, this was not a, doc a documentary. I mean, this was an infomercial. I mean, Look, you, you've got to go back to the Benedict book in 2020, which this documentary is based on, which doesn't give Bill any credit at all for the dynasty. That book was written solely for the purpose of to promote Art Robert Kraft's uh, selection into the Hall of Fame. And look, and I've said this numerous times, Kraft belongs in the Hall of Fame mm -hmm. for hiring the winningest coach in, in the league and getting six Super Bowls. He doesn't need to promote himself any more than that. 
But to me, this is kind of really backfired on them because everybody knew it was going to be slanted against Bill. And but I think the deception that was used, Matthew Slater is one of the greatest human beings of all time. And his comments were taken and put in a context and wrapped around things that made him look like he didn't like Bill. When, you, you know, having been in the building, there was no more uh, represent, uh, representative of the Patriot way than Matthew Slater. You know, and what he said was true. Right. You know, you, when you're pushing people to work harder. And the reaction has been remarkable. I mean, I, if you've read the Dan Shaughnessy piece in the Boston Globe, now Shaughnessy was taking a, a leave because he was had surgery, but he felt like it was so bad that this documentary was so bad that he had to come back and write something about it because it just was, you know, in his words, it was a farce, you know, and the concept was good, but the whole thing was a farce and it was all promoted to make it look like something that it wasn't. And I don't know how you could do this or write this and, and think that you could just basically write the man who's responsible for coaching the team in every single phase of the game and just write them out of it. Like it's obscene. And I love this line that Shaughnessy put in there. He said, you know, he said, uh, he went in there and he talked about, uh, you know, uh, he said, you know, Belichick is ripped for his players for his love letter to Donald Trump on the eve of the 26th election. But there's no mention of Kraft's one million donation to Trump's inaugural fund. And did we really need Rupert Murdoch to homage to Bob, which practically put RKK on par with Jonas Salk? Quote unquote, I didn't. You know, like to me, when you're trying to when you're trying to do things and you're leaving stuff out, you know, and I thought Edelman was really good. And he attacked Wes Welker about you don't even like Bill when he was saying mm -hmm. that Bill didn't ever coach Aaron Hernandez, you know. And so, like, it's just filled with all this stuff. It's like I didn't know the weight room was bad. He works out in the weight room. Like he worked out there. He knew the weight room. He was in the weight room almost all the time. Like, like you can't have it both ways. You can't put your name on it and then divorce yourself from it. Like it's just unfair. And I don't understand how an organization can go from having as much success that they have and just ignore somebody who gave his life and soul to the team and results in six Super Bowls and going to eight. Yeah, it's and I was talking about this with my fiance. I was like, are you not just happy with the six Super Bowls that you you won six Super Bowls in 20 years? Like, like, like the, I'm, I'm ashamed to, to say admit the things I would do for the Cowboys to win six Super Bowls over the next 20 years. Like, are you not just happy enough with the wins? Here's the Edelman quote that you brought up about Welker. He said, quote, Welker painted the picture like Hernandez was the king, like he got to do anything. I remember Bill motherfucking Aaron all the time. Come on, Welk, trying to make up stories. We know you don't like Bill. That's what Julian Edelman said. This is in the article that The Athletic wrote about it. Kraft was uh, asked about it in this article, said that he was disappointed by the negative emphasis and the hours of interviews that were discarded. <laughs> But when asked about Belichick's but he portrayal, was involved with it, Femi. I mean, him and trust me, he and Jonathan. I mean, this whole thing was produced to get RKK into the Hall of Fame. And again, I I support that. Like, you don't need this to get into the Hall of Fame. You you want? I mean, Eddie DeBarlow didn't write books. Eddie DeBarlow no. hired Bill Walsh and said, "You run my team and you win and you build my organization. I'll get the. It's my team. I'm going to get in the Hall of Fame." You're going to get in the Hall of Fame because you did this. You don't have to have a scorched earth mentality after the guy leaves and treat everybody as if they weren't. And, you know, and then, you know, then you see the player survey come in. Like, seriously, I didn't know we didn't have, you know, we didn't have uh, four families. Come on. Like, everybody yeah. there complained about that. For When I was there, like, the, you know, the, 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 the treatment of, how you were based on tickets, based on what was it was completely foreign to any team I ever worked for. Like you couldn't get you couldn't get club seats when you worked for the Patriots. You sat in another section. When I worked for the Raiders, they put you right there in the club seat so your family could go inside if the weather was bad. Not because and not because they were giving you anything money wise, but you spent money when you went in there. But but like seriously, there's never ever a thought of that. So like. And I think it's backfired. I think it's completely backfired because it's been it went so slanted one way. Now, Kraft can manipulate it and not answer the questions like he did down there when he was asked about, do you think it was unfair to Bill? And he went into, well, we hope Bill will come back where we put him in the Patriot Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. You didn't answer the question.
Exactly. Like it's just so, it's unfair, and you enjoyed so much success. You bought the team. It's now worth over seven billion. Those six Super Bowls, somebody had a lot to do with that, and 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 then increased the value of your franchise tremendously. Like there should be a little bit more of a of a respect and appreciation. To, but to have this be dragged through the mud like this is just I, I think it's really distasteful. As most people do, even people that don't like Bill. Even people that are not in the Bill Belichick camp, that are in the Brady camp, that he won all the Super Bowls, they think it's distasteful. Yeah, it's just, it's unnecessary. And this was something, because I remember when the trailer came out, I think it was last year or so that they were doing this. I was really excited for it. I was like, wow, like this, it's kind of going to be like the NFL Patriot version of what we saw with the last dance during the pandemic and the Chicago Bulls dynasty. And like, it's like, hey, like this is going to be something that we've always been clamoring for. Behind the scenes footage of the New England Patriots. What made them tick? Why did they build this dynasty? And instead, it's like a vanity project for Robert Kraft, which I mean, hey, he has its right. It's his right to go ahead and do that. It's Kraft Productions, but somehow we didn't understand that some interviews were discarded, even though we produced the thing. I'm like, who had, who, who had final cut? Account of, there's, there's never any accountability for it. Like, I'm a fan. Okay, you know, remember he said, we, we're just fans here. Yeah. But then you want to take credit for the winning. Like, how does that How does that jive? Okay, so let's just say that we agree. Robert Kraft was a fan. Okay? Or let's just say that. Yep. All right? Then how do you take, then how do you have the Patriot and take credit for everything if you're just a fan? Like, there's no, like, there's no... There's no consistency in anything that's being said. It's just not fair. Look, you can have a disrespect. You can not like the coach. You could think he was brazen and all that. Okay, fine. But I think to me, the success has to be at least shared. And and it's kind of makes you wonder, like, if that's how they treat Bill on the way out with six Super Bowls, how are they going to treat somebody who doesn't win? Good luck, Gerard Mayo. Good luck. That's all I can tell you. Patriots, by the way, open for business is what I've been reading about. As we said, the Gerard Mayo said, hey, we can, we might trade but down. But then as a, fan, as a fan, Robert's hoping that they draft a quarterback. Well, he knows what they're doing. I mean, you know, like, like, like Shaughnessy wrote, everybody knows that Jonathan is the de facto general manager, which is, again, and I'll say this clearly, his right. They own the team. They can yeah. do anything they want to do. But, you know, you're hiding behind it. And I hope Elliot does a wonderful job because I love Elliot. But the fact fact is, everything is going to have to go through this. It's just like Ger- Gerard Gerard Mayo saying we're going to spend. Well, Mayo, look, the last ten years, your team has spent the least amount of money of any team in the league over a ten year period. The Patriots ranked thirty second in money spent. They have mm-hmm. never ranked higher than thirtieth in money spent over the last five years. So, like, don't say you're going to all. The, you're not changing who you are philosophically, because that comes from the ownership. It's, I don't know. The whole thing is very unnecessary to me, and it should have more so been a celebration of the greatest NFL dynasty that we've seen in the modern era. Instead, should have been. it was. It's instead. It's, it is what it is. I'll watch the final four episodes to give a full report on this thing when I've wrapped it up. But why you're uh, wasting your time? You're wasting your time. It's an infomercial. Did you watch infomercials? I mean, seriously. <laughs> I remember Billy Mays back in the day. <laughs> R.I.P. to Billy Mays out there, OxyClean and everything like that. But uh, that does it for us here on this edition of the GM Shovel Podcast. Thank you to our producer Elliot Bowman with us on the ones and twos as always subscribe rate and review we're gonna get the pro days later on today i'm sure there'll be some more reaction out of that and then we'll be back with you guys on monday to break it all down uh next week and it'll be uh, it'll be almost april michael the time is flying by and the oh here we go the sp- yeah, spring, spring is, break coming up ho- ho- hopefully hopefully we get some better weather out there at ocean and city you're getting but, married so we're, we're looking I am. forward to that yes yeah, there we, we go are, yep we, we are very much looking forward to that family's coming into town on monday then no holds barred after that for an entire week uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure that'll be a lot of fun it's be a good celebration but we'll be back with you guys on Monday but we'll see you then be safe Michael I'll talk to you then man thank you Sammy